Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to welcome, welcome you virtually to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Today, we have a fascinating seminar. It is the IALS Fellow Seminar, and the title of the seminar is Foreign Relations in Pre-Colonial Africa, a Case Study of Portuguese Benin Kingdom Diplomatic Relations. And we have an excellent speaker today, and I'm fascinated by this topic and looking forward to his presentation. We have Dr. Egosa Ekator, who is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Derby. He joined the University of Derby Law School in September 2019, um, where he, as he was previously at the University of Chester, where he taught on numerous undergraduate and postgraduate modules. His main research areas are in international environmental law and natural resources governance. He received an LLB in law from the University of Benin and an LLM and PhD in law from the University of Hull. He's also called to the Nigerian bar as a barrister and solicitor in the Supreme Court of Nigeria. He is also chair of the International Law Committee for the International Law Association Nigerian branch. Um, Agosa, I guess you could just get your slides up and begin. Thank you very much. We're really looking forward to this. Thank you very much once again. My name is Egosa uh, Ekato. I'm senior lecturer at the University of Derby, and thank you for the introduction. So what I've got today is um, I've tweaked the title a bit. So how many minutes have I got for the presentation before I start? Okay, so I've just I've just tweaked my title. I've taken out the foreign, foreign out of the title. I've, I've renamed it Diplomatic Relations in Pre-Colonial Africa, a case study of Portuguese Benin uh, relation, uh, in a diplomatic intersection. So what was the motivation for this research? My paper outlined motivation for my research. I provide a brief history of Benin. And I also try and give examples in terms of the uh, diplomatic relations in pre-colonial Africa. I provide some examples from different parts of Africa. Then try and think if I can use a conceptual framework to underpin my analysis. Then, so then I'll talk about some characteristics of the diplomatic relations between Benin and Portugal. So from what I've read so far, I've seen a couple of uh, commonalities in in this relationship between Benin and Portugal. So I'll just discuss some of these uh, characteristics in my talk. And also, I also provide um, an agenda for future research and how I can we take this research forward and what's the implication of this research in terms of trying to contextualize it in this, 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 this the colonial uh, approach to international law, for example, the colonial approach to teaching of history and to, to, be, uh, to be like a counter hegemonic to against the Eurocentric nature of international law in Africa. So those are some of the issues I'm going to discuss. So next, the, my next slide talks about the term pre-colonial. So uh, I think it was last year, Professor Lufemi Tai did a very fantastic um, blog post about the usage of the, of the term pre-colonial. So Professor Tai will argue that pre-colonial as a term is very, very, is very is a bit derogatory, it's problematic, and he assumes that Africa had nothing about um, um, uh, civilization prior to the British or the European invasion of Africa or colonization of Africa. So Professor Wolfram Tao said should stop using the word pre-colonial that even amongst African societies there are also colonial uh, subjugation of uh, one African uh, communist society against another African society. So even though Professor Otai was very critical of, of using the term pre-colonial, um, I'm using the term pre-colonial Africa in this in this um, in my presentation, just uh, in the context of the new kingdom relationship with foreign traders and to show the, the relationship or the, the diplomatic or foreign relations in Benin prior to the British invasion in 1897. So the cutoff point for me is 1897 in terms of when I use pre-colonial Benin in my research. So that's why I just said them just provide further clarity on the, on the term pre-colonial in my research. So my personal mo motivation, I'm, I'm Benin. I'm from Edo State, Nigeria, the Benin kingdom, which used to be uh, Benin Empire. So Benin is quite different from Benin Republic, even though a lot of people say that uh, Daomi, which, uh, which is Benin Republic, was actually named after Benin Kingdom. So, but Benin Kingdom is different from Daomi, which is known as Benin Republic in West Africa. So, and if you've been in the news lately, you have uh, issues around the stolen artifacts by British officers. So, Benin has been in the news um, recently. So, my core research areas are international environmental law natural resources governance. I'm not a trained legal historian. I have no training in legal history at all, history, but I'm just someone who likes, I like to do historical stuff. So um, this is just uh, one, of the, one of the papers I've written surrounding 
legal history, African international legal history. So I'll be very, very grateful if I can get suggestions and comments on my work that I'm doing now. So some of my publications that I've done so far from on a legal history perspective, you can find that on the screen. I've got a paper on on pre-colonial legal system in Africa and assessment of indigenous laws of Benin. I also have another uh, blog post, a peer review, a peer review blog post titled Pre-Colonial Trade in Africa and International Law, Setting a Research Agenda, which was published in Afronomics. I've got a couple of other papers uh, researching around uh, inter African international legal history, but the caveat is that I'm not a trained historian. So maybe, so that will also affect the lens which I do my analysis. So in terms of this presentation, it, it falls within this large remit, this for that my my larger project that focuses on, on African international legal history. African international legal history is a very recent development in historiography on Africa. You have a lot of work on economic history, social history. Um, in the recent past, there have been not so much work done on African legal history. In the 60s and 70s and 50s, there was so much work done by people like Professor Elias and his generation on African legal history, but or African law as it was termed at that time. But now there appears to not be so much uh, working in this field. But Professor Opong, who I can see is, is listening now in one of his papers actually said, African legal history is still a very academic territory. So my, this study is basically to contribute to this academic field of African legal history by contextualizing my analysis in diplomatic interactions between Portugal and Benin in the 15th and 16th century. So African legal history focuses on contributing to African states to development and evolution of international law and the continual levers of these contributions in modern era. So not just because I'm focused on what happened about 500 years ago, the, 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 my, my, my study also analyzes the relevance of that relationship and also goes a, a long way to counter this idea that African states, uh, African society did not contribute anything to international law, did not contribute anything to the evolution of um, civilization. So my, my, my work also tries to contribute in that regard. So what is the basis for, for the rationale for my study? There are, there are gaps in literature on Benin Kingdom. In terms of literature on Benin history, there's so much work being done on, on the history of Benin, but there are very, very few works being done on the diplomatic relations of, uh, of Portugal and Benin. So in terms of what has been done uh, recently, you have academics such as uh, Frank Bamusa, late Professor Igbafe and Professor Kaplan, they've written about the colonial court system, the colonial court that were created by the British administration after the invasion of Benin in the early 20th century. So there are very few works on the traditional legal history of Benin that focuses mainly on the, what took place in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Uh, there are very few works being done. So the neglect of Benin-Portuguese relations uh, is, one of this, is one of this fundamental part of, uh, of research which is not being done. However, this is not the case in history, especially in economic history, anthropology, and other allied research areas. There are, there are loads of publications in this field. So the basis, the rationale is that there's a paucity of research on Benin Portuguese diplomatic relations, and this is very, very accentuated by legal history studies. So, so also, just to say that Benin traded with other Europeans, not just the Portuguese. You have the Dutch, French, British, but I'm focusing on the Portuguese because the Portuguese are a very fundamental impact on the culture of Benin, on the religion of Benin, on the society of Benin, and also there was, a, there, was, there was this influence of Benin on this Atlantic world that was created at that time and in other parts of Africa as a result of this relationship. So if anybody's interested in this research area, Professor Alan Ryder has written extensively on Benin's relationship with European traders. So uh, according, in a recent book by Professor Swanley, Professor Saga actually said that Ryder in his book captures these high levels of civilization attained by Great Benin before, before it came into contact with Europeans and how the empire managed to defend its core interest in a self-determined ways in face of European imperialism, which ultimately led to its force. So in a way, this captures what I'm going to do today, how, how Benin actually was played a very important role, saw Portugal as an ally and saw uh, Portugal as an equal during this uh, time. And this was just before the Eurocentric nature took over international law at that time. So... Uh, directly, this is a response. This my, my talk is a response to a call by by various scholars of Benin studies uh, that on the, on the on the lack of research on relations between pre-colonial Benin and other foreign states. So there have been a few papers in this area by by authority, uh, myself as well, Professor Robert, Professor Sadlo, uh, Doctor Zebu, Professor Idiakmuria, Fakwaibu, various other ETC. They've, they've they've done a couple of academic papers in this area, but there's a massive paucity of research 
in this uh, Benin Portuguese relationship. So Professor Saga said that um, that that uh, that that one of the current gaps in, that we find in in history of Benin, Benin Kingdom, that the period of relations with the Portuguese and other Europeans, which arguably offers better insight into the basis of Benin's greatness and relations with neighboring groups in South Tome, as well as the old good communities that Ghana and uh, than those of other and uh, than those of relations with British, which seem to have overwhelmed other historical relations have been neglected. So, in terms of the research, we tend to see a lot of uh, historians tend to overemphasize uh, or over for, uh, over research this um, the British invasion, the British relationship with Benin, and there's a massive neglect of what was happening with the Portuguese because. The Portuguese relationship, even though uh, the British Empire invaded and conquered Benin, in my view, the Portuguese relation had a more lasting impact on Benin culture, Benin society, than uh, even in comparison with the British, which also had a fundamental impact. But we should not neglect the Portuguese relations with Benin, our research on, on, on the history of Benin. So I'll just run through this methodology. The typical English history uh, methodology will not be appropriate for this research. So my, 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 my point is to do a bit of archival research in Nigeria and Portugal. And if I'm not able to do that, my, my, main, my main focus will be to rely on oral traditions via interviews from traditional sources. I know there's a lot of criticism of oral, oral traditions and ETC, but um, a professor, a Dr. Jacob Egariwa, who is one of the leading scholars on Benin history, we want to read one of the first historical books on Benin. He was not a trained historian. He wrote this book, and his book was based solely mainly on oral traditions. About 30 or 40 years later, um, scholars, Western scholars researching on Benin were able to actually uh, provide evidence from the archives in, in different parts of the world to actually say that what Professor, what Dr. Chifegareva did in terms of oral tradition was actually correct. So oral tradition should not be, should not be, Taking to the backwaters, oral tradition also plays a very, very important role. So I also try and rely on Benin oral tradition as one way of eliciting information regarding the relationship between Portugal and Benin. So, and also as Professor Potter actually says in a recent paper, she says that the way we frame and describe what, what Africans did depends on our approach to history and whose perspective we center. So sometimes we don't center the African participation in our historical stuff. We overly project the, 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 Western, uh, the Western idea of what Africans went through at that time. So in a way, my paper is to, is to provide some sort of um, um, perspective regarding what uh, the Benin Kingdom did at that time with the Portuguese. So, so I just run through this as well. Background to the Benin, Benin. Benin Kingdom was one of the most important forest states of West Africa during that pre-colonial -pre era. A Benin Kingdom met all the criteria of state in modern sense. So if you're doing international law and, and the criteria of statehood, whatever criteria you're going to use to define, it, to define a state in today's world, Benin actually met all those criteria. It, 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 had, it, had, a, it had a defined territory, it had, it had, it had the defined boundaries, it had the super authority, it had defined population. It is so it meets all the criteria of a state. So if, even though statehood was not defined the way we see it now. So if we apply the same analogy or the same criteria of, of statehood or international law, creation of states in international law, apply to pre-colonial Benin, Benin would have been a state, it would have met all the criteria. So the Lusha is one of the leading British um, experts on, on African history, actually said it was Benin of all African kingdoms, which Europeans traded in the 16th century that the traders and chroniclers found most impressive. So in Benin, the Oba is, is the head of state and government in the pre-colonial era. So the, the king, the Oba of Benin, uh, he epitomizes the judicial, legislative, and executive powers. Even though the Oba was very powerful, we also had like um, chiefs and other, 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 other uh, organs of the state that also served as um, a way to check the powers of the Oba at that time. But the Oba was like was a supreme, powerful, um, uh, representative of the state, so it was like so the the state the, the state the, the state was uh, the over the over of the state. So at that point in time, so also this also fits within this Eurocentric nature of international law. So in the 15th 16th century, the Portuguese came to Benin and saw Benin as equals. But in the 19th century, many of the treaties entered by the British with many African kingdoms did not consider African kingdoms as equal partners. That was when this this 
Eurocentric racist ideologies surrounding international or threats um, uh, uh, germinating its roots at that time. So in the 19th century, international law became very, very, very Eurocentric, and some might argue very racist, and Africa and many developing countries and many developing parts of the world and many uh, non-Western parts of the world were excluded from this development of mainstream international law in that point in time. So now, in terms of what I'm going to do, what 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 is the existing sort of conceptual framework? So a lot of scholars have done loads of work on diplomatic practices in pre-colonial era in Africa. For example, uh, you have scholars doing international relations, doing uh, history, doing um, social relations, etc. So. Uh, the Professor Levy believes that Africa has been described as this, the breadth of statecraft, peacecraft, and treaty craft, as well as innovative international. That even though we say that Africa did not contribute to the evolution of international law, and we all believe that that Africa, the first person actually came from Africa. So, in that, if you push, if you use the analogy, Africa is the birthplace of whatever we have today. So, furthermore, there has been extensive research in African uh, uh, pre colonial societies contributed to the development of international law. But Professor Garcia has done a bit of stuff in his area in terms of the, the contributionist and the critical approaches to this perspective. So you have people like Professor Elias, Akintori, Smith, and other scholars that basically said during this time, African customary, there was an element of African customary international law that what we, what we see to be customary international law in the modern sense, we had a semblance of that in pre-colonial Africa, but this was, uh, this was mainly based on African customary law. So Professor Elias has also argued that many pre-colonial African states and societies had contact with foreign states, Asia, those Asian and pre-European at that time, and that pre-colonial African states uh, uh, actually makes it possible to speak of an existence or universal body of principle of African customary law that is not essentially just similar to the broad principle of European. At that time, there, was, there, was, there were some certain characteristics of customary law that regulated the relationship between uh, pre-colonial African states and the foreign parties and the foreign uh, countries and foreign traders that came to Africa. So similar to what we could see now in terms of the way co customary international has developed from practices of states over time, we could also say at that point in time in the pre-colonial Africa, you also had common customary practices among different African states that regulated the sort of the relationship between uh, non-African states or regulation relationship between different African states uh, in that time. So from an international relations perspective, Dr. Pella also argued that there existed in Pecolonia Africa an international, African international system, or more specifically what he has termed the West African international system, that within that West African, West Central African part of Africa, there was some uh, existing, it, it, it basically conceptualized the pre-colonial practice at that time to, to be part of what he termed the West African international system. So, I would also make a similar, uh, also this, uh, as a similar idea that says that there was there were a couple of um, practices and uh, laws that govern the treatment of strangers in Africa at that time. Duty of hosts to guests at that time, and the protection that was extended to foreign traders, or was, was existing in Africa in the pre-colonial era. So in that way, everyone was saying that we can actually speak of an African customary international law. Professor Smith also has a similar viewpoint. To that regard, so also Dr. Paul takes uh, Dr. Professor Mao takes a somewhat distinct perspective he, in his book African Union Law. He says there was little intertribal or in modern parlance international law, however, significantly there were rules that govern the making of war and peace and the peace and rules that govern relations between the very tribes. So, in a way, even though Dr. Mao does not believe that there was an existing what you call what you might call international law in the strict sense in pre colonial Africa, but you have some characteristics of them. Um, of rules, you have some criteria that will govern the, the, the pursuit of war and settlement of war in Africa at that time. So, and also, I've also done, I'm doing something with a colleague of mine. We are analyzing some principles of uh, diplomatic practices in pre colonial, colonial, and post colonial Africa as well. So, and it's also in some of my publications, I've actually developed this idea which I've called Less, Less Mercatura Africana, which I've argued that. That, in, that pre colonial Africans and foreign traders are engaged in trading activities in Africa akin to less material, which is a Western concept that was quite popular in medieval Europe in terms of regulation of trade. That in Africa at that time, there are similar ideas, similar concepts existed, even though there was no explicit reference to less material in pre colonial Africa. I have termed these uh, trade interactions, these trade uh, usages between African societies and foreign, uh, foreign traders at that time, I've termed them. 
Uh, after this international trade interactions in pre colonial African society, as less migratory African, so it's something I'm developing as a theoretical framework in my research as well. So, in the, con in the com coming to Benin, my view is that the diplomatic relationship between Benin and Portugal was largely governed by indigenous or customary law of Benin. I'll provide examples in the next slide. So, in that time, in, in, pre, in my views, in the pre in pre Benin, the, this relationship between Benin and Portugal was sort of pinned by indigenous laws and the powers exercised by the Oba and his lieutenants, new chiefs, and his representatives. So, if you read uh, Tiomsky's work as well, it states that in their relations with, relations with Portugal, Benin's Oba has maintained complete control and sovereignty. The information the Oba's gained, including that obtained by the embassies and the potential of Benin state, allowed them to pursue a rational and beneficial trade policies with regard to Portugal. So, Mexic also has a similar opinion about the relationship and the dynamic between Benin and Portugal at times. Says at the diplomatic level, the Portuguese were at no time able to avoid the complex diplomatic procedure at the Oba's court. As political actors and missionaries, the Portuguese representatives could only advance their interests there to a minor extent. Even as traders, we were obliged to meet their do business partners on an equal footing. So this is this is if you, you I don't know many people are not even aware of this information and the relevance of this of of, of what the, the Portuguese relationship and Benin. So in a way, this goes against the tenor of what we know in the pre-colonial era. Yes, pre-colonial era, some African uh, states were, were conquered and um, some Western states actually used uh, brute force as well to take over um, African kingdom. But in the context of Benin in the 15th and 16th century, you could see that Benin kingdom, Benin leadership, the Oba, the chiefs, were operated on a relation and equal reciprocal relationship with the Portuguese. And this exemplifies the importance of of this um, study to, to, to research. So what are the elements of Portuguese Benin relation, diplomatic relationship? So from what I've read so far, from, from the analysis I've done in my own research, these are some of the things I've seen uh, that are in literature so far. Uh, Nevadomsky in Muswanles will suggest that by the 15th century, Benin had a very solid political organization and the system works away. By the time the Portuguese arrived in the 15th century, they encountered an advanced kingdom that could not be intimidated or converted to European Christian, Christian. Even though uh, the church, a church was built in Benin in the 15th century by the Portuguese, even though one of his sons of Yoruba became converted to Christian at that time, and even though uh, the, you had Portuguese uh, Reverend Fathers living in Benin and the influence of Portuguese on Benin culture, the, uh, the, the Yorubas at that time basically said, we're not going to convert their people to Christianity and they maintain their identity uh, of their people. So in a way, if you compare what took place uh, with the Portuguese and, and Congo, what is now Angola in uh, Central Africa, they, they went, when, when, when they went to the Kingdom of Congo, the Portuguese, they basically imposed religion, culture on the people, and everybody in Congo became um, uh, Christianized. When Benin, yeah, the, Benin, the Beninese accepted Christianity, but they did not fully, the other did not, did not fully, uh, in a way, push down the religion on the people. So Another characteristic is reciprocity in terms of the, the relationship between Benin and Portugal. So in terms of Portuguese language, the, the Yoruba sent, some of the Yoruba sent their children to Portugal to, to learn Portuguese. And when other foreign traders were coming to Benin in the 15th, in the 16th, 17th century, the, 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 the interpreters in the Yoruba palace were also speaking Portuguese to other foreign traders. So Portuguese became like, um, like the lingua franca, like the language of commerce at that point in time, and as a means of communicating with foreign visitors to Benin in the 17th century. So that was one of the uh, um, elements of relationship. So you also had official interpreters at the Palace of Benin, uh, of the Oba of Benin at that time. So according to Professor Elbe, it says that the captain of the Portuguese ship, Sam Miguel, encountered such an interpreter at the court of the Oba of Benin. So when, when, when foreign traders came at that time, they, 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 yes, they had a language issue, issues as well. But they don't have a writing uh, uh, script culture, but you had someone who was an interpreter who understood being, who understood Portuguese and was able to interpret between the Portuguese traders and between other foreign traders who came to Benin at that time. So there's also the influence of Benin Kingdom of Portuguese language, uh, Portuguese school in South Tome because of the because South Tome and Prince South Tome used to, it was the port that that when the Portuguese were coming to Benin, when they were going to Portugal, that's where they used to normally take to Portugal. So even up to now. The language of Edo people has influenced the major component of Portuguese crew, which also says that the continued relevance of um, this relationship. So also, also, also have the influence on, on of Portugal, the culture, language, and religion of Benin. So people have said they have the earliest Christian roof in Nigeria was planted in Benin in the 15th century. A lot of people say that the first church 
in Nigeria was viewed by the Portuguese in Benin, what brand of Nigeria. And, and in terms of the, 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 the you, had, you had some some words in Benin actually from Portuguese, like ekuye is a Portuguese word which means spoon. So, man, so even up to now, there's the they still speak a, a, a corrupted variant of Portuguese in, in the past of Benin, which is called Portuguese. It shows that there's a lot of influence. And also some some of the, the some of Benin's products such as clothes and artifacts and pepper we also taken to to the Atlantic world that was being developed at that time. So Benin Kingdom received and also Benin Kingdom also exported goods and products to to the parts of the world that Portugal was controlling. So they also trading goods. There was a massive trading goods between Portugal and Benin. They also the establishment of a port at Ugoton, which was called most of the books you find they call it Guato. Ugoton is a village near Benin. So the Portuguese actually established a trading post, which also helped them to enhance their trading interactions with the Benin. So Everybody also goes on to say that um, uh, that in terms of uh, the Ugoton sort of port, uh, practical matters were handled by the chief of Ugoton, the port of Benin, but the overall responsibility of Portuguese affairs belong to Chief Osho, the one of the four townships of Benin, one of the main advisors of the Oba of Benin. So the links of the Portuguese with Benin, the great Israel, were assisted by an official interpreter chosen by the Oba. So Dr. Nonso Bikele goes on to say that the most likely economic driver of Benin expansion was trade routes that opened up of the coast. And in the 18, 1480s, Portuguese traders reached Benin opening up new trade routes between the area and Europe. So, so some scholars have said that Portuguese supplied arms to Benin at that time to, to fight the various wars, but there's no consensus of that. But I believe that there's some, some of it was some sort of arms that, that were that were given to, to Benin at that time. I, you could see that in some of the Benin artifacts that were produced at that time. So Benin also had ambassadors posted to Portugal. He also had representative of, of the Portuguese king coming to Benin. He also had a very, very, very important role of the Oba of Benin in these trading interactions. And so my view is that during this time, the, the relationship between Portugal and Benin were where they are both parties were considered themselves to be equal partners or trading partners. Arguably, during the 15th and 16th century, the national law was yet to be fully Eurocentric in nature and practice. So this uh, relationship between Benin and Portugal evidences it. You also have um, the trade between Sao, Benin between and Sao Tome as well. Professor Elias provided some examples that there was, there, was, there was a contract signed for the trade of Sao Tome between King Manuel of Portugal and Fernand George was a Benin person on March 15, uh, 26th of March, 1515, which contained a clause stipulating that each year of duration, uh, George would bring 500 quintals of carry. So it just shows at that time, uh, the Portuguese and the King of, uh, and, the, and the King Manuel of Portugal was already signing an agreement or uh, a contractual agreement with, with Benin, with Benin uh, citizens at that time. So you also had, uh, also, uh, they also to provide another example that in, in, in August, uh, Second, fifteen twenty-six, the address to King John III of Portugal, the King of Congo, which is now in Angola, complained about the people from Kachin and Benin who were at that time causing trouble in this country. So at that time, we also have Benin people were traders, Benin people were also moved to South Tome as a result of the relationship between the Portuguese and Benin. So I just quickly run through this before I finish. So so there's a massive influence of of, of we have Benin ambassadors put to, to Portugal. Also, uh, because of this trade with Portugal and uh, Benin, with, because of the trade with its neighbors and foreign state, Benin was, became a very, very powerful empire in, in the 15th to 17th century. You also have the influence of Benin can be found in the Atlantic world. But throughout, throughout this relationship between Benin and Portugal, the, co the commonality was that Benin maintained its sovereignty throughout its interaction. So if you read uh, Davidson's work, Dr. Robertson's work, they talk about the attitude of people beginning to trade and economies where a Dutch visitor of uh, David Van Yenda had observed in earlier in 17 that the Benins were very prompt to business. They were aligned on the ancient customs that we set their side. But once we uh, foreign merchants comply with this custom, then the, the people of Benin are very easy to deal with and labor not needed for a good agreement. It just shows that in the context of wars, the uh, a legal framework regulating that relationship. You could see from this quotation by the Dutch visitor that Benin at that time actually had an effective legal system regulating this trade. So, uh, agenda for future research. This is a work in progress. And uh, so, one of the key research that I, which I hope to answer is in, 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 uh, in very real terms uh, to contextualize is in terms of dispute about trading treaties between Benin and Portugal. How were these disputes resolved? Was it, was there? Uh, was that some were they, were they taken to courts in Portugal? Was it fully resolved at in Benin? 
can can I get information about this in Portuguese archives in in different archives in the world? That's what that's the stage I am in as we said. But the key question which I hope to answer is that how did how were these trading disputes resolved? What was what in terms of the dispute about trading uh, treaties between Benin and Portuguese? How were these disputes resolved? So this is a core research question which I hope to answer in the near future. So what is re, what is the what is relevance of what I've just said regarding? Uh, relevance of pre-colonial African contemporary legal studies instead of international law. So many of us are aware that in many African countries, even in, in Europe, law budgets, law courses, including international law and its various stands are taught from a very Eurocentric, Eurocentric perspective. There's a, there's a massive neglect of the role of Af pre-colonial African states in development of international law. So my my paper suggests that aspects of pre-colonial African inter international interaction should be embedded in the curriculum of African universities. So, so a very good way to do it is to provide an example of the Portuguese and British relationship to show how African states at that time contributed to international law. So in my paper I did with Dr. Wankwa, I suggest that the teaching of pre-colonial African trade usage should be explicitly embedded into the public national law uh, program in Nigerian universities. And, this has been done in many international relations programs in Nigerian universities, but from a public international law perspective, uh, this is a reluctance is by some Nigerian universities to actually embed this idea of pre-colonial African states and international law in the curriculum. So uh, international law should be decolonized in Africa. So if you go to many African states, international law is still taught from a very Eurocentric uh, perspective. Most of the scholars, they don't tend, most of the teachers or lecturers, they don't tend to uh, overly value the place of pre colonial Africa contributions to international law. So in the context of the UK as well, there has been a move to decolonize the curricula in the UK. So one of the ways of decolonizing the curriculum in the UK is to add, to, is to add the contribution of pre-colonial empires and people, including pre-colonial Africa to the curriculum. I know for, 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 for secondary school students, there's um, uh, in terms of history being taught to uh, students in secondary school in this country, there's allusions to Benin, the history of Benin. So in terms of international law, there should be some form of way where um, where the, the uh, international law should be decolonized and the contributions of non-African, sorry, non-European societies uh, from Asia to India to Africa should be mentioned, should be talked about in international law. So there should be research conducted on the impact of non-English speaking West, uh, Western uh, and including countries in the Americas in, in pre-colonial Africa international legal system at that time. So there, more research should be conducted. So for example, Green in his paper Beyond Imperial Atlantic relies on archival judicial sources to show the interplay between uh, the relations and between the, show the interplay and relationship in the 1520s between Caribbean and Cape Verde communities of the coast of Africa. And also due to the lack of availability of resources in English language, especially on Atlantic was class from non English speaking European countries who endeavor to publish their writings in English language. So there's a massive research being conducted by Portuguese scholars on pre colonial Benin and pre colonial Africa, but unfortunately, many of these materials are not available in English language. Also, English speaking Africans should be encouraged to further their study or research in non English speaking countries to learn languages, thereby improving access to archival materials which are not written in English language. So, for a good, a good example, that if you are going to go to get the information from Portuguese archives, you need to have the money to pay someone to to to, to read or understand the Portuguese of that era, or if you're able to speak the language, that could also help you in your research in that regard. So, fine, my, my concluding words, this paper fits with, with into this recent trend in global legal history as enunciated by Du. So, so my paper also fits into my research of African international legal history. Um, African international legal history focuses on the contrib contribution of pre-colonial African states to development and evolution of international law and the country relevance of these contributions in modern era. So African scholars, including the law academics, should engage in similar research. There is a lack of scholars working in this research area, so we should, we should, en should endeavor to do more in this research area. Furthermore, I adopt the words of Andreas Joash Ushema, who stated the following about pre-colonial Benin Kingdom during the voyage of 16... Uh, 03 to 1604, and I read from his quote, of this kingdom and its inhabitants, especially their system of justice, their regulations and laws and warfare, marriage and so on, there will still be much to write because it will take too long with you of this short time at my disposal. I will leave this to another opportunity. So I end my 
my talk with this word, the motto words of um, Andreas Joshua. So it's an ongoing research. It's a non, I'm not sure I'll be able to complete this research ever, but as about try as much as possible to publish what I can publish from this research. And I, uh, I was very, very grateful for comments, advice, and clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. Um, I may have to slow you down a bit, though, so because you covered a lot of material. I'm going to take uh, Chair's prerogative and ask you a couple of questions to start off with. First of all, just a comment. I think this is such an important project. It's a large project. It's going to take you a long time, I think, but it's such an important project to decolonize international law in Africa. And what you are suggesting is it's so very important. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, first of all, was you were mentioning that you were going to, and um, I should say we've got some prominent guests here. Um, at, and they've got some questions too. And there are some professors here who specialize in this area. So I'm going to mention their names um, when I talk about their questions. So first of all, um, Professor Farida Banda from SOAS is here today. And she uh, was very interested in the oral history aspect. Who are you going to be interviewing? And that was my question too. Well, how's your methodology for developing the oral history? Are you going to be interviewing elders? Are you going to be in what genders? Um, how are you going to prepare? Because that seems to be this social history aspect about it. I should uh, disclose a bit of an interest. I've got a history degree. And <laughs> so I'm very interested in that aspect. So how are you going to develop that methodology to continue your research? Okay, thank you very much. Because um, I've, I've done, in terms of oral traditions, I understand the criticism and the sort of the, the validity of it. So what I, what I intended to do is to basically, because the, of the chiefs I mentioned, Chief Oshudin, the, 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 the chief priest of Ogoton, they still have their relatives that are living up to now. So I'm going to interview the the family members of those of, of, of those people that were that were involved in the trade that were representative of the other at that time. So I'm going to interview someone like Chief Oshudin, Palace Chiefs, and people in that era. But in terms of gender, I'm not really some the the the, the truth is that some African cultures can be very patriarchal. So but I'm not looking at it from gender, I'm looking at it from the people that were involved in that trade at that time. So can I get their representative in the current time? If yes, can I interview them? Yes. And also, in regarding, there was another question that talked about um, how do I, in terms of, um, I've relied on um, on Dutch sources, right? So these Dutch sources I've relied upon, they are just, rep they are just, they are just evidencing oral traditions. In oral traditions, all of this information has been mentioned also, if maybe if if maybe these Dutch sources or these um, Portuguese sources were not there, people would not believe that they existed. If you are a Benin person, you actually know that, that the the Yorba, the Yorba's conquered. They went to some some places and conquered this place, and they had interaction with Portuguese. These were represented in our cultural artifacts because if you look at the 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 the, 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 the sculptures that were done in that time, that was our script. That was our right. That represented the interest. So in a way. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll validate the interviews with archival research and also validate it with the, the sculptural works that were done at that time that showed the relationship between the Portuguese and anybody. But the unfortunate thing is that I can't really get, there's no, it's difficult to get the perspective of people, the Benin people that were living at that time because they did not leave, leave the information in script, in written form, but they left the information in sculptural works so which we can use as a sub, it's not perfect, but we can use that to basically evidence. And, and finally, uh, as I mentioned before, Chief Egaiba wrote his book on Benin, was oral traditions. So, and we look, we're saying that, oh, why can you rely on oral traditions? But when Western scholars came and they compared what he actually wrote, they were able to find evidence to justify it. It may, it may have made mistakes with the date of Yorba's ATC, but the information he provided were actually correct. So in a way, if you can get information in the archives to corroborate oral traditions that I'm going to get from the field, then that is um, very, very useful for my own research. 
Thank you, Professor. I don't know if I answered Professor Banda's question. Okay, well, you've got a couple of other questions, so stay tuned. Um, okay. So this next question is from Richard Opong, and he is from Case Western University. We've got a really international audience today, I must say. Um, and he is uh, he has a question for you. I am interested to know what are the key goals, objectives that motivated Benin's diplomatic relations with the Portuguese as a state. So he's accepted your argument about the statehood. Did Benin seek to advance particular values in its diplomatic relations? Thank you very much, uh, Professor. That, that's a very interesting question. I think it depends on how you look at the relationship. So when, when initially, when the Portuguese came, the Portuguese came thinking that we were looking for this mythical figure of, I think, Preston John, this Christian king in, in West Africa. And when, so when they came to Benin and they saw Benin was a developed state, so the Portuguese were very particular about trying to convert them to Benin. And when they came to Benin, the Yorbas were wary as well. So that's why they tried to put them, they put they had the port outside of Benin. And also there was a time that there are some two, two Reverend Fathers were actually arrested by the king and put in house imprisonment. And the Reverend Fathers had to write letters to the king. So in a way, the Beninese were trying to protect their interests. I'm not sure they were about influencing Portugal fully. It was just what could they benefit from Portugal. There was a, there's some allusions to that there was a war situation between Benin and Ida. It's not a part of Kogisti that the, some, some scholars say that the Beninese were, they went to uh, ask Portugal for Portugal to provide mercenaries and provide guns that some scholars believe that Portugal did not provide any guns, but some scholars also believe that Portugal has provided some guns for Benin. So in a way, yes, Benin took, took, took some advantage of relationship and they, they tr they made, in the trade made the country, made Benin to be quite rich as well. And they were, they were able to get a lot of exotic, exotic products from Portugal as well. Like even up to now, the coral beads that they wear in Benin is actually from Portugal. And also in terms of some of the things used to make this picture work, was actually gotten from these interactions as well. So yes, economically it benefited the empire. That's what I would say. But the Portuguese did not did not did not stay long, but they were unable to convert Benin to to, to Christian nation. Then you had that you had the Dutch, you had the English and French that came afterwards, after the Portuguese. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we're moving from California now to South Africa. So Tana Mag Maggoka, sorry if I've murdered your name, has a question. Um, she asks, how has your research looked into how this international law, so to speak, was domesticated within the internet within the legal system of the Benin Kingdom? So how was the international law that you talked about, this customary international law, uh, domesticated into the Benin Kingdom? and how international relations impacted the domestic legal system of the Benin Kingdom? Hmm. That is a very good question. To say the truth, I have not, I have not thought about that, but I think from what, from, what, from what I've read so far, I think if you look at the relationship and look at it from the perspective of, of, um, of, of the impact of, Port of Portugal on Benin, for example, on the language, on the culture, because even the way the way some of our the way some of the dressing from Benin actually came from Portugal, the influence was very so in terms of it maybe what we could say in terms of what we know as customary law now, right? It must have been influenced by the the the, 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 the interaction with the Portuguese. And also I think I think from that perspective, I don't know, I don't know how we could say it was yeah, it has been domesticated into international law has been domesticated into legal system of Benin, but customary legal system of Benin. So in a way, I think if I flip that question, how does customary law of Benin at that time, how was it compatible with what the Portuguese came in? Was there, was there some compatibility of custom, customs and the Portuguese ways of doing things? Because it, it appears to be that, the, yes, there are some conflict at that time, there are some issues, but we were able to settle it. So we were able to, because as the last one, the quotation which I made was that, yes, the... The, the customs of Benin was the default rule. However, they were willing to let go of their custom for the sake of making the trade to be successful. So I think that would be that would be one way to look at it. I think I need to look for more into it, but it was a very 
that's a very good question. I think and I, I don't know answer that, Prof. Yes, and I wanted to add something to that. There's sort of two levels to this. So you look at how international law might be incorporated into the domestic system. But you said something very important in your presentation. And I've looked at this in other areas. I did a book on customary humanitarian law. And it's extremely important to actually look at how the customary norms in Benin, in West Africa, as you said, the West African international system, how they might have influenced the international system. So as you said, there was a cross relationship yeah. between Benin and Portugal. So what I think is really exciting is if you do it both ways, look at how uh, the Benin system might have been influenced, but also how the Benin system might have influenced Portuguese relations, especially when you look at back that far, it, it certainly could have had a substantial influence. Okay, so the next it's, question, it's, is that all right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next question, Joseph doesn't tell me where he's from, so I don't know. This is Joseph. He said, when compared to the interaction, interactions between Benin and other countries, people's kingdoms, how advanced and cordial was the Portuguese Benin kingdom diplomatic relations? Um, I think comparatively, I think it was cordial to a large extent because 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 the Benin actually actually allowed Portugal to build to build the church to a certain extent. Actually allowed Portugal some of the Beninese to convert. Actually sent ambassadors to Portugal. Uh, Portuguese um, the, the Portuguese also sent representatives to Benin. But as we find the relationship, because the the Oba refused to be to refuse to be to be to be fully a Christian and the society to be fully Christian, there was a bit of issues around 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 the, the, the workability of relationships. So that's why for a time the Portuguese left Benin because and also uh, if you read some work because we said because the, the Portuguese were looking for a trade route, we're looking for cheaper pepper. So when they discovered pepper from India, there was this there was no need to be focused on Benin. And when they took the Benin pepper to to Portugal, it was not as as lucrative as a business and it was so from a Portuguese perspective, they looked at the trading benefits and for a while they were trying to get enough benefits and when they realized they were not getting that benefits from Benin, they just let go and the, the port was actually abandoned for a while as well. So that, I don't know that answers the questions. Thank you. And Joseph says he's from Nigeria, but he's residing in the United Kingdom. And uh, Farida had a, a comment and a question. So it, she in, indicates the Benin bronzes in the British Museum, we mentioned this earlier about, speak to the interaction between Portugal and the Benin Kingdom. Will you use the artifacts and the documents of the British Museum and other museums to try and engage um, your future project, the resolution of disputes? Yes, thank you very much. Prof. Yeah, but, but, because it's something I've been trying to get funding and uh, funding for. I've not been able to get funding. So the idea is to go to uh, the various, the various archives, the various museums in the world, and use that to evidence it. And also, there's also uh, many of these um, artifacts that have actually been put in an online uh, museum. You can actually there's a, there's a Benin Museum online. That if you click on that, the artifacts are actually there. So some they don't need to actually physically travel. To, to 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 the US to, to to London for example you can find many of the artifacts on the internet on this website that has been provided yes we can use that as an as an example even some people doing carbon dating as well that could also provide could pro provide you answers but I think the, the, the best thing would have been I think the, the, the issue is that there has been a lack of anthropological surveys in Benin lately in, in the 70s and 50s and 40s there were a lot of uh, anthropological surveys and diggings being done in Benin and that those excavations brought out a lot of fantastic stuff which because what we know as Benin now is not Benin of the invasion Benin was destroyed as a city so many of these things were actually went into the ground and many of the cities were destroyed so if maybe we can go back to doing anthropological excavation as well that will provide further evidence of this of this of this uh, i'm not trying to paint benin as a very very that there was no issue in the, in the, in the entity or no problem i'm just trying to say that from a perspective of a trade relationship you could see the equality so to speak in the relationship with portugal 
Thank you. And so you're saying when the British invaded, the the uh, Benin cities were destroyed at that time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Benin city was actually destroyed, and there's actually there's actually a, there's actually um, a piece in the Guardian about ten years ago. It was a guy, it's a guy who wrote it. He lives in Togo. He's a Togolese, but he's from Benin. His great grandfather ran away during the British invasion and escaped from Benin. So there are a lot of people migrated outside of Benin and now he escaped to Portugal. So at that time, the, the, the city itself was leveled and people were killed. So, so well, basically many parts became, they were rebuilt afterwards. So in a way, and if maybe the British did not, because when they came into, came into the palace, they basically ransacked the palace and took wars in the palace. So they took our history with, with them. So what happened was that because they took those artifacts back to Britain, they also brought uh, brought evidence to the creativity, to the, the civilization of Benin at that time. So, so I think that was, yeah, so that's that the major issue. So, so a lot of excavations were being done in the 60s and 70s. I think it was Dr. Professor Kona, C-O-N-N-H, did a lot of work in that time as well. So they could get some artifacts from the Portuguese era, some things that were, that were buried in the ground were actually found, like spoons and, and utensils that were made in, in about three, 400 years ago could be found as well. Um, just to follow up on that, if earlier in your presentation, you talked about this debate about pre-colonial history and that the, the term was, and now it's sort of brought it up to my, to my mind about the invasion of Britain and pre-colonial. Is there any other word that can be used to describe, in other words, you're, you're talking about Benin as a state, as an entity that was destroyed by an invasion in the late 1800s, but prior to that, it was an existing state. So it's not pre-colonial because it's not a colony yeah. state. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an existing political entity. And that's why I find your research so fascinating because that perspective, um, I'm a big fan of David Olaswaga, and, you know, he talks about this. That the, And also, um, who's the fellow in the States that does this work? Fascinating. Um, looking at at West Africa as a political entity, not a pre-colonial uh, non-state, but a state. Yeah. And I think I really encourage you to, to focus your research in that way because, um, you know, there are international law criteria for states and you say that, 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 that this political entity may, met that criteria. So I think that's an, a, an excellent way to approach it. Well, um, I'm just gonna call, make a final call. Are there any other questions? We're just about finished our time. Oh yes, Farida says, curious about whether you have engaged UNESCO intangible cultural heritage resources. Um, no, I've not engaged with that. So I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm not. I'm not researching the um, the, the the rules and laws regarding cultural artifacts. So I'm just trying to restrict myself to. The diplomatic relations and maybe uh, lack of lack of the right word pre-colonial Benin. So, so I think if I'm going to do stuff about the heritage side, it's, it's good as well. But I, I'm trying to be because I'm not a historian. I'm not. I'm trying to do what I'm comfortable doing. So maybe with time, I can I can I can do more research about that so, as well. Thank you, and and it strikes me that you might want to be in touch with Farida. She's got a lot of uh, a good input yeah, and expertise. She's I'll quite big that. in this area. Well, yeah. I want to thank everyone from attending from all over the world. I'm sure you um, will join me in thanking Agosa. It was a fascinating presentation. I'd like to see all your slides. And if you ever want me to read anything, I just will volunteer because I find this absolutely fascinating. And I think you're right. It is an under-researched area of international law. It's an under-researched area of international legal history. And on behalf of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, I thank you, but I also wish you the very best of luck because this research will have a huge impact on the way people view Africa and view the history of, of that continent. So I wish you the very best of luck. And thank you're getting you tons much. of compliments in the chats as well. So, thank you very much. Okay, so I just want to say thank you, and we will complete this for today. Is that all right, everybody? Okay, bye-bye. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.